Hello, my darlings. Mother Raven here with another Folklore Thursday. Today I am sharing a story from a book that a very old and dear friend of mine has just published. I will post a link to it in the description. It's about all sorts of tales from the area he lives in, northern Utah. Ghost stories, UFOs, and since it's Folklore Thursday, I will share with you a Bigfoot story. Bigfoot at the Beaver John's story It was the mid-2000s, and I was working as a manager at the Beaver Creek Lodge up Logan Canyon. I worked three days on and four days off. Managers generally stayed at the lodge for the duration of their shift, so they didn't have to commute back and forth. It was great to not have to commute and to have four days off in between shifts. I was working one night in late summer, early fall. It tended to be a little slower during this time of the year. The summer travelers were all gone, but the fall rush had not started. There was not a lot to do until the trees started to turn colors. Once fall was in full swing, we would get tourists coming up to enjoy the beauty of the canyon. It was a Thursday night, and we only had two guests staying with us, a husband and wife. The couple checked in at 5 p.m., and soon after, the remainder of the staff went home. I finished up my paperwork and various other duties and went to my room around 8 p.m. I had fallen asleep with the TV on and woke abruptly to a pounding on my door around 1 a.m. I hadn't undressed, so I got up quickly and groggily opened the door. The husband was standing in the hallway looking rather nervous. He asked if they could check out immediately. Confused, I asked if something was wrong. He hesitated for a moment then stated that he and his wife were on the balcony enjoying the moonlight when something ran across the parking lot right in front of them. I told him there wasn't anything to be afraid of. I explained that there are a lot of animals in the woods during this time of the year when we didn't have many guests. Many people that visit are not used to the woods. I suspect that maybe a bear or a mountain lion had scared them. He looked at me and said, it wasn't an animal they had ever seen before. I asked him to describe the animal to me. He shuffled his feet and said, It ran on two feet. He continued that he and his wife wanted to leave. So the two of us headed to the front desk, and I quickly checked them out. I watched as the pair threw all of their belongings into the car and sped off into the night. Shaking my head, I walked into the office to place her paperwork on the desk. I sat for a moment, gathering my thoughts. Suddenly, I had an eerie feeling I was being watched. I reached over and turned off the light on the desk. On the wall in front of me, a shadow was cast from the moonlit window onto the front of the desk. It was the large silhouette of a head on a massive set of shoulders, with no neck to speak of. I turned to look, but the window was so high I couldn't see what was there without standing on something to look, and I wasn't interested in doing that. Fear gripped me as I slid out of the office door and stood in the hallway. Just then, something slammed into the back of the building with such force I felt the blow in my guts. I quickly ran to my room, I slammed the door and sat there in shock. I stood quietly for what seemed like an eternity when I saw lights coming down the long driveway that led to the highway. I ran downstairs to greet a concerned highway patrolman at the front door. I brought him in, and before I could tell him what happened, he asked if I had seen anything strange. He scratched his chin as I told him what had just happened. He explained that they had received four calls about someone running across the road above the lodge in a dark suit. We both agreed that it would be a very odd thing for someone to be out there causing trouble 
on a Thursday night in September. At this point, the officer walked outside and situated himself where the shadow stood outside the window of my office. I shut off the lights to see how his shadow compared to my visitor earlier. The officer was about 6'2", and whoever had been there previously had to have been at least two feet taller. He came back in and we chatted for a bit. I asked him if anything else strange had happened to him in the canyon. He stated that they were not allowed to talk about strange things that go on in Logan Canyon. He did say it wasn't his first night chasing shadows in the area. After he left, I sat up watching TV. I jumped at every sound. It had taken me quite a while to feel comfortable being alone at the lodge. I was told by someone who worked there before me that on the nights that you don't hear the coyotes, you would know that they are around. Coyotes don't like Sasquatch. The second story I have to share from this is called The Trapper, Tim's story. I grew up in Hiram, Utah in the early 80s. I'd never given much thought to ghosts or the paranormal or other than the odd Halloween story and ghost stories around the campfire. I was raised LDS and as a young man, I was big into scouts. I remember that all my scout camps were throughout northern Utah. Summer camps at Bear Lake, fall camps in Logan Canyon. Our ward camp out at the end of summer was held in Blacksmith Fork. Camping was by far my favorite part of scouts. My favorite scout camp was a winter camp at the Quonset Huts at Camp Wapiti. Wapiti was up Blacksmith Fork about 13 miles from Hiram. I looked forward to this camp all year. It was a Friday night filled with night games, sledding, candy poker, my favorite. At around 9 p.m. the leaders would be huddled around the stoves or in bed. We would take our bags of candy and go to the only hut with a big table and we'd eat candy and play poker. We'd bet handfuls of Jolly Ranchers, bags of M&Ms, and sometimes Smarties. This trip at the end of January, 89, was no different. We got to camp and argue over who would sleep where. The top bunks were too hot, the bottom bunks were too cold, so we all fought over the middle. We had cooked our horrible dinner, burnt Dintimore beef stew, around 10 p.m. after sledding the hill. Then we wandered back to play candy poker and warm up. There were eight scouts in my group, including my best friend Travis. We did everything together. We all took off our snow gear and hunkered down to play a few games. Before we knew it, midnight rolled around and we were on a huge super sugar high. We debated what we should do next when someone suggested a game of hide and seek in the snow. We immediately broke out the door into the night. The full moon had risen from behind the clouds. The mountains glowed in the moonlight, and its reflection on the snow was so bright that it seemed we could see forever. We chose someone to be the hunter, and the rest of us broke out to find a hiding spot. I chose to cross the bridge over the river and head for a stand of small trees that lined the river. As I got to the brush, I crouched down on all fours and started to crawl along them, listening for the sound of anyone who might be looking for me. The ground was covered with an icy crust that was about two inches thick. There was two or three feet of soft snow underneath. As I inched forward, the top crust of the snow would cave in, and I would have to crawl back on top. After I crawled about 15 feet, I broke through the brush into a clearing and stopped dead in my tracks. Across the river from me was a man standing and looking right at me, it was not someone I had ever met, or anyone I expected to run into out in the woods. He looked like an old-time trapper, a young man in his late twenties, but his face had seen hard times. He was in full buckskins from head to toe, and wore a necklace with what looked like bear claws hanging from it. He did not have full beard, but 
scruff from a month or so of not shaving. In one hand, he held an old black powder rifle with leather fringe on the stock. I could see a bone-handled knife sticking up from his belt. Below his old hat were deep gray eyes that stared at me with concern. It felt like forever as my brain was trying desperately to process it all. He raised his hand and motioned me to back up. I just stared in disbelief. Again, he motioned me to go back. I slowly started to back up towards the brush, trying to keep him in sight. Suddenly, my foot hung up on a branch, and I looked back to free it. I quickly swung my head back around, and he was gone. I sat quietly and listened for the sound of footsteps on the hard snow, but all I could hear was the bubbling of the river. After I backed out of the brush, I sprang up and sprinted to my Quonset. I undressed, jumped into my bunk, and sat up all night, thinking about what I'd just witnessed. The next morning, I told no one except for my friend Travis. He looked at me funny, but he could tell I was shaken. After breakfast and before we had to break camp, Travis and I walked the river on the side I had seen the trapper. When we got to where he was standing, there was no tracks. I couldn't believe it. I looked across the river to where I had been and my heart dropped. Right where I had stopped and the trapper had motioned me to go back. I saw my tracks in the snow. They had ended just before the edge of a huge cornice that overhung a deep hole swirling in the river. Had I gone any farther, I would have fallen in. With my heavy clothes and snow boots on, I would have certainly drowned. I've no idea who this ghost was or why he saved me, but I know what I saw that night and will remember for the rest of my life. I will forever be grateful to the ghost trapper that saved my life. So quoth this rape.